So I was a, a bit of a, a well, a, a completely loose unit. He was just a dealer when I first met him, and then by the by the end of the time together, he was cooking meth for two Auckland gangs. I'd become a meth addict, and and I had a really bad cannabis habit. We did the work of supplying corporate. Um, banks and they said oh we're arresting you for kidnapping there is hope there is hope um stop believing the lies young soldier of god steady march yo it's your boy dave here and this is the felon show hope all is going well out there god bless you all how about you introduce yourself sister and where you're from hey dave thank you so much um i'm janet balcom um, my married name is janet curl but most people know me as Janet Balcom because that's my author name. So I'm from um, Auckland originally, but I grew up in Ruwai, up by Dargaville. Well, again, it's, it's, it's awesome to have you on the show today. And I'm sure that um, a lot of people are going to definitely resonate with your story. A lot of women will definitely resonate with your story. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to jump on the show. But yeah, this is Janet. So um, man. <laughs> A beautiful story of redemption here. Um, she actually has a book as well, The Wild Side. Um, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So that's me on the cover there, running away um f from God actually at a hundred miles an hour, literally, um, right up until I was thirty. Wow, wow. So no, so yeah, so um, definitely go check that book out. I'll leave her links in the description and in the comments if you want to check that out. Um. Again, just really awesome story. She actually also has a publishing company um, and a like a resort rehab. Um, it's called Arapahui, um, Arapahui Retreat. Oh, Arapahui Retreat. Cool, cool. So yeah, yeah um, def so yeah, again, I'll leave all those links in the description so you can check that out. Um, she's obviously a very busy woman. So again, I'm I'm grateful that she was able to um to take the time out to to share a bit of her story. Obviously, she's only gonna be touching on it. So definitely check out the book and, and things like that. We actually met a few through a mutual friend as well. So um I'm just grateful to God that you know he's brought us together. Definitely love everything that Janet's doing. Um but look, to, to start us off, so you're originally from Auckland, but then you moved to Dargaville, was it up north? Yeah, moved to Ruwai, uh, which is 20 minutes south of Dargaville, just a little tiny wee podunk town. Um, but the people are beautiful, you know, and um, really good community. Um, yeah, like I said, had a good upbringing and that, but it was funny, um, when uh, when things went west and the headlines were starting to hit the Herald and stuff about what uh, was going down with me, um, they a lot of people didn't know how to handle it and and even like moved on to the other side of the the road when they saw my parents coming and stuff like that. So you know, like drugs and and things like that, crime that wasn't something that you were exposed to up until when. Like, was it pretty innocent teenage years and? yeah fully fully absolute normal upbringing eh? and um and so when I got ex well uh, I suppose like like what happened was that um a major rejection happened to me in a betrayal at school so I was probably about um about 13 14 and and literally my identity died and and I thought, flip, if, if I'm not okay, then who am I supposed to be in this world, you know, if I can't be myself? And and so um, I sort of buried that original person and then invented someone else to be, which was just a mask, you know, real um, angry, hard, didn't care anymore, uh, do it to them before they do it to you, all that stuff. My brother was, was killed in a hit and run in Auckland um, when I was 19. And he was only 24 and um and so that just gave me a good hard shove even further down the hole and I, I added all the prescription drugs and anything I could afford to the alcohol I was, I was a worker though so I always I always um was was very serious about my work even though I took lots of time off because of hangovers and stuff but I managed to hold down um ju just jobs in the corporate area as a um executive secretary when my brother died um, my mum called out to God and said what the hell is this is the point 
of of raising these kids and pouring your life into them and then having them taken just in a split second like that and he said to her um there's nothing I can tell you that's going to help you an answer to that question right now but just take my hand and so she did she just um accepted um Jesus Christ as her Lord and was born again and then she she became the first real Christian in our family and began to pray for us and she prayed for me for 18 years and just saw me get worse and worse and worse but the fact was that her prayers were being answered and that there wasn't a point of time for me to um for the lights to go on well it was it was shortly after that that I met um uh, my ex said it well I'll call him my ex if you read the book you know people will be able to figure out who it is um but we're all good we're we're still on speaking terms and and he's a mate and all that but um we we um we hooked up and then he was we were together for like 11 years and so he he was uh, a dealer he lived a double life so he was a professional guy as well and but he was just a dealer when I first met him and then um and then by the by the end of the time together he was cooking meth for two Auckland gangs um and so you know when you look at outrageous fortune and that like we we never watched that because it, it was so lame you know and, and we were living it anyway I'd become a meth addict and and I had a really bad cannabis habit and all that that was pretty much just a and cigarettes and that well can but, you talk about the beginnings of that like the meth addiction and, oh, yeah. and sort of what was going on in your world at that time <laughs> so like I was green right like mm. country girl literally country girl and and then and so even just the tattoos were shocking to me you know the hardcore like you can't see any skin type thing that was shocking to me um and that was that was my ex and his friends and so even that alone it was traumatic for for a while and um so it didn't take much for me to actually like become psychotic really (laughs) because it was such a culture shock um and the and and the drugs were so pure um so we were blasting um not we went I mean that was um, pre-smoking and and pipes and all that sort of stuff so it was just at the beginning the end of the speed sort of thing and the beginning of um, of P and and because um, he had access to the absolute pure um, you know when you had it you'd just sort of nod off and and it actually had more of a downer effect than actually an upper um but I, I really liked it and I probably was a worse addict than he was. You know, if, if he didn't have any, then it was it would just go to bed, who cares? And then, but not me. <laughs> it was terrible. Um, but but the, the needles were shocking as well. And so it was just everything, everything was shocking. And literally I, didn't, I was like dropped into uh, a quite a hardcore world that was so foreign to me, I might as well have been in, Japan or China (laughs) and and then there were times when I thought far out I don't even know these people eh and and it was only luck I I thought it was only luck that I actually like they didn't kill me because they easily could have you know if they'd been the type of people that that I thought they were at times when my mind kind of went a bit west and, um, you know, you, t- you talk to people about their psych- psychotic breaks and stuff like that. And the stories are just basically so similar. They're, they're carbon copy. Yeah. And it was all that. But it turned out that uh, my ex actually was quite a good dude. And, and his mates were mostly the ones that were close to us. They were they were good people. They were just lost like me, you know, and, um, and, and doing their best. But, I mean, he grew up with, um, you know, in, in that, in a little cul-de-sac in West Auckland with Mr. Asia and that, and just grew up as kids playing together. And then he noticed that, oh, all the people close to that guy were dying and he didn't want that. So he made a conscious choice just to 
um, you know, as an adult, just to drop things down a couple of notches and keep it a bit more um, sustainable. But it was, I failed to heed the warnings of some of them, which I won't even go into detail because people will know who they are just by describing things. But it was like a bit of a horror movie with, you know, people picking and cutting and scratching, you know, scabies if they're real or not, we're not sure. But I thought, oh, hopefully they are because that's a little bit not not quite so freaky as them. <laughs> it's like just being in your head. <laughs> mm. um, and so... I don't know. I think something about women, they just se seem to go harder on the drugs and, and the need to medicate whether the pain's more or whatever. Some of them made a conscious choice to just go hard nuts and be dealers and, and cooks and all that stuff. And there was a, a, a time when I thought about, about just, you know, uh, embracing that. And that was one of the times when when I know that the Lord um, influenced my thinking and I didn't think about it for long. And then I was like, oh, no, nah, who needs that? I mean, life's hard enough already. We created gra uh, Paradox Graphics as a, as a front for the drug business. And um, because I had corporate contacts in there, I, I just pulled them in and learned how to do this graphic design and stuff on, that, on the Mac by someone who was close to us. And then... Um, and actually, really, for six years in that scene with, um, you know, basically being in a gang pad, which was our house, um, for six years, we did the work of supplying corporate um, banks with their financial reports, having them printed and designing the covers and all of that stuff, which is kind of crazy. So police could never really figure us completely out. So, like, when were your initial encounters with the police, and and how was that for you, like at that time? Well, I was so disconnected from 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 planet Earth. It just it just all went into the out there basket. You know what I mean? I was I think I was actually disassociated for quite a lot a few years. <laughs> but for example, like. I mean, even seeing the ex punch people through the the, the the window of the car that's that's up, still up, <laughs> and stuff like that, and it's a whole car full of people and he's only one guy. That was kind of shocking, and I was like, okay, either someone's looking after us or we're, we're screwed, you know, because we're hopelessly outnumbered and all that. And then one time... Um, I was standing in the bathroom and again, I'd been chasing this other new, other corporate bank and I'd finally got an appointment with them for new business. And I was standing in the bathroom doing my teeth. <laughs> and then a cop appears in the mirror and like here and here. And I, and I was going, um, <laughs> um, am I psychotic again or is this actually happening? this is my bathroom and um and they were real and they said oh we're arresting you for kidnapping and I went oh cool <laughs> that's all right because you got the wrong house <laughs> and I thought it would be as simple as that you know they'll just go oh right okay check the address off we go take all the dogs and the drug squad and um and the ladders and the torches and off they'll go but but no and so that was, yeah, ended up with, I ended up like, you know what they do, they, they chuck all the charges on the girlfriend as well as the guy, just to make the guy go, oh, hey, no, it wasn't, wasn't her. Yeah. And anyway, so that's what happened. And most of them disappeared except for the kidnapping charge um, on me. I actually, um, it, it, I got convicted of kidnapping. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. Which I think is just, there for the story you know what I mean because it was completely bogus um it was just a series of unfortunate events that um the cops we were milking to the max to get the ex because they'd been after him for a while you know I was still working I was working right and I'd had this I was I was running between the, the my my place of work to pick up reports that I was um I was typing and I had an act like my ex said to me, you know what, get 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 the insurance um, organised for the car. And I went, yeah, okay, and never did it. And um, 
And then I had an accident in uh, in his BMW and it wasn't my fault, but this egg had gone through a red light, but I was like, heck, it might as well be my fault because I'm going to have to pay the price for this. And I was a bit concerned. Um, and the people who had hit me, they were bottom feeders, if you know. <laughs> I mean, I say that in the nicest possible way, but but there was no hope of getting one single cent um, in, in damages towards the car. So um, in, long story short, um, I ended up having to take him down to see his parents, like just to get some kind of point of contact for when he fled off into the Netherlands and we never heard from him again. And we're like, flip, mate, you guys need to help us out with fixing our car. But um, so because we had no car, uh, I had to find a ride down there. So um, the ex rings up a couple of people to to get a ride and one of them had just got out of jail for like 10 years murder on compassionate grounds and he was going to send me off with him <laughs> uh, but luckily he couldn't make it and anyway um, um, so someone turned up and and I was like well I, he said you stuffed it up you go and fix it so me and this guy and this other guy uh, the driver went down to to Thames trying to find some relative that we could say hey this is what your son's done like can we talk to you and and just help can you help him work it out and be accountable and maybe pay us off and we were actually trying to like sort it out real nicely we didn't even punch his head in or anything like that and I wished I had <laughs> <We're not> anywhere <laughs> cops go don't take matters into your own hands you should have insurance I'm like, well yeah <laughs> in the <laughs> world <laughs> But anyway, so I actually, I treated him really nice. He was really freaked out just by the surroundings. It looked like a gang pad with guns on the walls and animal heads and, you know, all of the, the stuff. <clears throat> um, I did take like a walking stick with me and it did, it did have a bit of a massive long blade inside it. And I, <laughs> I did show that, show that to him, but I was never gonna use it. Um, and he, as soon as we got back, it was just a wasted trip, completely wasted. He could have fleed off at any time, um, like he wasn't tied up or, or, or anything like that. He could have disappeared when, in Coromandel when we went and visited some mates and we left him completely unattended. And um, came back and said, look, just, just keep in touch. You owe us this much money because that's how much the, the dude said that it's the damages and um bring us every every second day or so and, and just let us know how you're going and and put some money in whenever you can and and that was it he was gone and then he went straight to the cop shop and said that that uh that we'd kidnapped him oh, and then okay. oh who and i went he he said my ex's name and he was like oh uh cool well yes we're, we're interested in that and so he just basically used it they used it as an excuse to get in the door yeah yeah oh well so i mean that's a big escalation from the country girl um i did i did like bad boys in fact there were <clears throat> some nice guys that really liked me but they weren't any good because they were too nice for me which is sick it's just like, it's a reflection of how much we actually hate ourselves and don't believe in ourselves. And um, it's it's really twisted. But but in, in his particular case, I never liked him at all. And so I would not have gravitated towards him. Um, uh, but it was actually, um, he, he, he just wouldn't take no for an answer. And, and, and I, uh, it was the drugs, to be honest which is so low I mean for me and 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 embarrassing to say that but but it was because I wouldn't it wasn't someone I would have would have gone for absolutely not I mean during this period of time what what would you have I guess like labeled yourself would you have labeled yourself towards the end there a drug dealer or like 
No, what, not me. What would you have sort of? <laughs> what was your part in 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 all of this? Would you say? Um, I was just um guilty by association. I think. Um, I mean, I in a lot of times I held things together when they would have fallen apart naturally. Um, just because when the going got tough, then I got going, uh, whereas someone else just went to bed and didn't want to deal with anything. So I guess so. So in the latter years of that period of time, what what did end up what what did end up happening um for you? Um, I really did um fall in in love with him, and so that was um you know a um a legitimate sort of relationship there although it was very toxic extremely toxic you know codependent and bro broken people hurt people kind of thing so um <clears throat> I definitely wasn't happy I was making him unhappy too we had some good times and all that sort of stuff but we couldn't actually like like end it and so he kept going to jail every, you know, every few years in and out and in and out. And I'd hold things together uh, on the home front. And then uh, after 10 years of being together, we uh, had a child together. And, um, and then I got really sick and the baby got really sick with a, a campylobacter, a gastro um, thing where you, you, both ends are going for two weeks and, you really need to be on a drip or something, otherwise you die of dehydration. <clears throat> and that that was happening um, to me um, slowly, but I didn't realize it because I was just so dead um, anyway. And uh, I realized that at one point that I couldn't get off the floor anymore. I was just lying on the floor and I couldn't get up and um, I couldn't make my baby another bottle. It was the end of the road. And so um, the ex was getting ready to go to jail again and just focusing on himself and and um, seeing his tattooist was more important than seeing the lawyer and all of that BS. And then uh, I said to him, um, how come you, you don't look after us? And I'd already said to him prior, look, if you keep, if you keep cooking, we're gone. The, that's the last warning it's over and so you need you need to stop and and he, he thought well she'll never leave me and he was right like I literally couldn't unless there was a divine intervention and he never thought that would happen and I never thought that would happen uh, I was serious when I said that but uh, I I would have done my best I probably would have left but I, I wouldn't have been able to stay away but anyway, he said um, in response to why he wasn't looking after us, he was like just stepping over us like I was a log on the floor and not even helping at all. And and he said, well, what, why don't you just call your parents? And I thought, I would never have thought of that in a million years because um, you get so isolated and so far down the rabbit hole that you can't even think normal anymore. You just forget friends, forget family and all that. And... <clears throat> And so um, I called dad and, and he came and got me and stuff and, and I never went back. So that was, that was a massive um, thing. Like I, I, li I literally said, oh, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of days when I'm better. <coughs> and uh, it took a couple of weeks for, for the fog to clear um, and I couldn't walk. And, and when I got, I got, got to, <clears throat> excuse me, I got to Ruwai and looked in the mirror and, and I saw in the spirit and I saw the mask of death. I, I saw my face just turned into a, a skull. And I saw that like for, for a second and I went, wow, I had no idea how close to death I actually was. And it didn't really worry me because I was, I was still so numb and like, who cares? Like, almost bring it on kind of thing and I used to joke about um you know I I had all the lies like oh hell's not a real place hell we look we're in hell now and and um and I used to used to joke about Armageddon and stuff like that and, and say oh yeah I'm gonna get it <laughs> <laughs> that's how dead my spirit and my soul was and disconnected from reality um, 
so a couple of weeks after I'd been uh, healing at mum and dad's, you know, the fog cleared and I thought, well, I'm out. Why would I go back? I was really unhappy. And then I realized that I would go back if um, God wasn't real because I needed more than just my own willpower. And um, and so I said, God, if you're real, you better show up now. Otherwise, I'll go back. And my son will end up just like his father and I'll just end up fading off into, into Never Never Land. And, um, and about three, three days later, I had a massive vision um, in my sleep and it was so horrific. It was a combination of The Exorcist and the other worst movie that anyone can ever think of. It was, oh no, probably the worst psychotic break that, that you can think of all, all tied up into one. So um, that was the first time I'd ever been actually scared and I um, ended up telling my mom and she said, oh, yeah, well, that wasn't a dream. It was a vision from God. And he was pulling back the spiritual curtain and showing you what's going on in your life. And she said, I'm going to a um, a prayer meeting tonight. You can come along if you want to. And I was like, mm. oh, man. <laughs> that right there is the second scariest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no, I'm not going. <laughs> so all day I was like this massive battle and then then I was telling myself it's okay you know you're not you don't need to go just say you're not going at the last minute and I was going yeah yeah that's what we'll take <laughs> so mental. and then um I got there and they said well I was just saying all this stuff just to shock them because I had like preconceived ideas of of Christians and and a long long walk socks and sandals and uh, all these thou shalt not and all that stuff and and uh, and and living in Pleasantville or whatever and and I thought that's not real life that's not reality what do you know you know and I was just trying to to shock them but they weren't shocked they just the most shocking thing to me was that there was a group of people in a room that were there because of love not because of some ulterior motive or some agenda where they're going to get something so that was foreign I went like I literally it took me it, it took me a long time to come to terms with that and I think that was the thing that had the biggest impact on me um was realizing the the the, the chasm between the two worlds and which one was the real one and then when I was sitting in this room they said well do you want to um do you want to give your life to Jesus and I went what does that mean and literally, it was just words that just went over my head. It had no meaning. And and then I thought, well, um, actually, what have I got to lose? And I was so at the bottom of my barrel that um, I I said, oh, okay. And so I let them pray for me. And I thought, oh, my head's going to spin around and around like the exorcist thing and um, the exorcism of Emily Rose. <laughs> I was really terrified of that, um, but but God was good and and nothing. I didn't even notice anything happen, but they cut some curses and stuff off from me and um, the generational curses it, cannot be overstated of the effect that they have on on people. Mm. And you know, with uh, cycles of rejection and cycles of alcoholism and sexual abuse and that sort of thing, and um, so I didn't feel anything at the time, but I was like, oh, wow, that wasn't so bad. And then the next day, though, it was everything was different with me. And I felt like a light had gone on on the inside. And I felt lighter walking around, but I also felt like the darkness had gone from inside of myself and like the doom and the depression and, and just that, that feeling of hopelessness. And I just felt light, like literally like a light had been switched on. And, <clears throat> and I thought, fire out. It's like I can see in color now and I've been only seeing in black and white up until now. My burning question had been, what is the meaning of life? What the hell am I here for? What is it all about? There has to be more 
to life than this. And so now I had someone to ask. And so I, I said to the Lord, you know, what am I here for? And he, and he just said, uh, I've called you by name and you are mine, you know, and this is, this is for all of us. He has not made any mistakes when he made any single person. We, we're not here by accident and, and we're here to carry his glory and his power to bring healing and restoration to the broken world, to bring glory to him because he paid the price for us even when we were still sinners. So uh, I took that personally <laughs> and it was like, I saw myself nailing him to the cross for my own sin and all the BS that I'd done and all the ugly stuff in my heart and, and, uh, and, and all of that. And so I thought, literally that broke me, eh? When, when, I, when I saw myself doing that to him who had never sinned. And I, and I thought, oh, well, the only thing I can do to help even pay him back is just to surrender my life completely to him and to do his will for the rest of my life, not mine. But in the first two weeks, the spiritual battle was so intense that I thought I wasn't going to survive because I didn't know how to fight in the spirit. So I'd say, you know, like for all I've been through with living in the, the, the world of drugs and addiction and whatever, um, my biggest challenge and mess that I made was in the spirit. It was in the spirit. And, um, and that was cool because God had to teach me how to fix it. And in doing that, then he taught me how to help other people get really, truly get free. And so when, when people are, are talking about getting free from addiction or getting healed from trauma, you know, um, you have to deal with the whole person as, as Māori know, te whare tapa whā. You have to deal with the whole, the whole picture. Body, soul, spirit, whānau. And a lot, of, um, a lot of people try to do it without dealing with the spirit or the trauma that goes back to childhood or back to the womb or the generational stuff that wasn't even theirs in the beginning, but it was coming down on them through the generational conflict and curses that, that hit them in the womb and they couldn't even deal with it before they were born. And so for the last um, uh, eight years, I've been, I'm married now um, to Ray Curl. And so my married name's Janet Curl, but people still, my author name's Janet Balcom. But we've been learning how about um, pr praying and ministering to people for inner healing and deliverance. Um, so this is, dealing with the whole person and that's what how the recovery center came about because after after I wrote the wild side then people were coming to me saying can you help me I'm an addict or I know an addict and I think no I'm just like held you know I'm just one person that 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 found the way out you know what I mean and now now I'm busy and I'm, I'm sort of doing publishing. And then the other set of people that were coming to me was, um, oh, I've written a book or I'm writing a book. Can you help me? And so everything. Um, and so that's kind of how Wildside Publishing got ramped up to being more than just uh, a medium for me to get my books published because no one was going to publish my books. <laughs> so I had to learn how to do that myself um, with God. And um, um so in response to can you help me with my addiction my answer was no I'm too busy and God looked at me and went you that's ugly hey <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me hey um if you don't care about people then what do you care about <laughs> and that was that was hard to hear and, and I had to look at my heart again and go, okay, well, I've still got some work to do on my motives and my actual heart agendas. And so it's always, you know, bringing it back, bringing it back. Um, 
we are here to, to, to tell people about the healing and the answer and the truth. Uh, not about it's not about the work or whatever you want to do so um so that's when uh god led us and guided us to buy this um to, to form a trust called wild side charitable trust and then downloaded a massive vision for a healing and recovery center and then th like it took three years of preparation and groundwork and traveling around the north and meeting everyone who's anyone doing something for recovery we're, we're halfway through restoring the place and we've got an amazing small tiny team of volunteers that are, are just epic um and they like we've halfway restored the place but there's still like a lot to do but but the need is such that people are still saying can you help me can I come and so for the last oh, year we've been taking people in in a limited capacity and doing our best to help them around the work. We've got a, a volunteer that works in Paremoremo and, and she's just asked for another whole box because it, it's just really going down well there. And also these and um, Worry Women's and all that and Mount Eden. And these two books are, are, are other books that I wrote, but, but these are extra cool because they're other people's true stories. There's 35 amazing true stories just real short in a nutshell um most most of them are kiwis and um they've got pictures and um they're just like it only takes you 10 minutes to read one so they're very good for guys who sort of just read bullet points mm, yeah you yeah, know that sounds good it sounds like they should be handed out in schools as well they should yeah. They absolutely should, yes. Man, Janet, we're sort of coming to the end here now, and I just really appreciate you again taking time out of your busy schedule to um to share the story. And um, I know that it's going to speak to a lot of people. I mean, um, in closing, do you have sort of any messages of um for any maybe woman out there that were where you are or you know anything like that, sort of stuck in toxic relationships, can't sort of see a way out? Fully, um, I like here on the back of the wild side this this nails it really there is hope there is hope um stop believing the lies um i actually would just say um uh, i would challenge i i would challenge everybody in fact just to say the the thing that i said in my heart that started it all that changed everything for me was um God, if you're real, you have to show me. Show me that you're real. And you don't even have to say it out loud. It was a thought in my heart while I was dying of a broken heart on the couch. I would, I would challenge, challenge you to, to just say that and see what happens. Be open. Mm. You know, um, there is nothing too broken and too messed up that God can't fix it. You know, the world has different words. Like there, there's a new term that I've just I've just heard of, Stockholm syndrome. And I was like, what is that? And that is that is when a woman cannot leave her abuser. You know, they just keep going back or they can't leave. And um we call that in in the Christian world, we call that soul tides. And so I just went, oh, okay, Stockholm syndrome, PTSD, all this stuff. Okay, we have different words for that. And yes, it's real, but we know how to actually fix it, not just medicate it. Uh, and I've got nothing against medication. Um, we work like that with uh, mental health in, in Dargaville. And, and unless some people, you know, unless people are medicated to be able to be stabilized, you can't help really help them if they're, you know, psychotic or something like that. So there is a place for that, but it's unless they've got a chemical imbalance, they're very. It should be short term, and it can only work hand in hand with the appropriate counselling and ministry. Look again, Janet. Thank you for taking your time for jumping on the show, and um, we'll talk soon anyway. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dave. Bye. All right.